seeing all those kiddos, they're so special, makes me think of a Sunday school teacher. She, uh, she was talking to her classroom, and she said to her kids, she said, if I sold my house and my car and had a big garage sale and gave all the money to the church, would I get into heaven? And they yelled back, no! Oh, that made her happy. These little beaming children were grasping the concept that she had been trying to teach them. So she asked another question. She said, so if I cleaned the church every day and I mowed the grass and I kept everything neat and tidy, would that get me into heaven? No, very enthusiastically. No. She beamed. These were her Sunday school children. She had taught them well. So she confidently asked them, so how do I get into heaven? And a little five-year-old boy from the middle of the pack very enthusiastically yelled, You gotta be dead! <laughs> Anybody want to be a children's pastor? <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> so today I want to talk to you about free. If you haven't been here before, our church's theme for the year of 2017 is life with Jesus. And so each month we're taking a new word, which you can see on the wall, and just exploring what that word, how that word describes life with Jesus. And for the month of July, we've been doing the word free. So I want to talk to you about free today. Free to choose. Now it's not the, like, choose, free to choose whether you want to love Jesus or not love Jesus. I want to talk to you about free to choose after you already are serving the Lord, after you have a relationship with him, free to choose to say yes or no to God. Now you might be sitting there saying, who's going to say no to God, right? Who's going to say no to our amazing God who created everything, created us? Who's going to say no? But this is what came to me as I was preparing for this, is when God pricks our heart as Christians who serve him and follow him, when he pricks our heart to do something, we either say yes or no to God. In our minds, I think when God says, you know what, go over to that lady in the grocery store and help her. She's having trouble getting her groceries together. Go and help her. We don't necessarily say no to God. We say, God, I'm busy. I got kids at home that need to eat, and I just ran in here for, for two minutes. I needed to grab something for supper tonight. I don't have time, God. And then we go on our way. So we didn't actually speak the word no, but it was a yes or no. And we said no because we didn't do it. And that got me. <laughs> I was like, uh oh, <gasps> yes or no? How many of you would say no to God if he was standing right here in front of you, saying, hey, would you go pick up that trash over there because it, it makes the floor look messy and we want people to be comfortable here? We'd say, yeah, you're God. We're going to do it. Yes, I choose to say yes. So I want to talk about what it looks like when we say yes to God, when he asks us to do something. And when I read my Bible, I see a lot of people in there that model saying yes to God. And in there, I see three things that are pretty common to each person that says yes to God. So I'd like to, to dive in and see those three common threads in the lives of people that say yes to God. When he says, will you do this? And they say yes. Okay, so our first common thread in people in the Bible who say yes to God is expect difficulty. Now, I want to encourage you to say yes. So why would I say to you, expect difficulty? Because it's true. If you look at people in the Bible, a few come to mind. Stephen, he said yes to God. He was preaching the word, and he was stoned to death. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they wouldn't bow to the statue. They wouldn't worship a god other than their god. They said, yes, God, we will only worship you. And they were thrown into a furnace. Expect difficulty. I want to get to our Bibles um, because I want to show you in Scripture um, to expect difficulty. I'd like you to turn to Acts 14. On Monday nights, Pastor Bill and I are doing a Bible study with the women and the men, and we are studying Acts. And so um, I'm just thoroughly enjoying the conversations we have, the discussion, and, and just studying this book of the early beginnings of the church. So let's step into uh, chapter 14. Um, actually, I'm going to start in chapter 13, but we aren't going to put that on the screen. Uh, Paul and Barnabas had been commissioned by a group of believers to go out and preach about Jesus to um, 
the surrounding areas. And in that sending, we call that their first missionary journey. So Paul and Barnabas in chapter 14 traveled to Iconium first. So let's start with chapter 14, verse 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent a considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the gospel. Well, this chapter co continues to go on, and they preached in, Lys uh, in Lystra. And Paul happened to see a man who had faith to be healed, and so he said, walk in the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And they tried to worship them as gods. So Paul and Barnabas tore their clothes. They tried to keep them from worshiping them, trying to keep them to, from sacrificing to them. And it was tearing their hearts apart because they loved God, and they wanted these people to worship God, but they were trying to worship them. So they finally got that crowd settled down, and uh, the people who resisted them in Iconium showed up, and they took Paul, and they stoned him almost to death. They thought he was dead. And they took him outside the city f and left him for dead. Okay, so expect difficulty. <laughs> the early church, they went out. They were commissioned to go and do this for the Lord. They were doing the right thing, and yet they experienced difficulty. We should expect difficulty. Let's bring it to Chisago City, Maranatha, Chisago City campus. When you say, when Pastor Bill says, you know what, we need help in the nursery. We need someone to, to just hold babies and love on babies. And you say, God, I feel like you're, you're asking me to do that. And so you sign up for nursery. And that day, a new mom comes, and she, her little boy, she brings him into the nursery, and he's got that clear drainage from his nose because he's teething. Okay, and a diaper rash because he's teething and he sits and he cries in your arms and you play ball with him and you watch cars out the, the, the window because he likes trucks and you do this, but he cries the whole time and you try really hard. But the mom comes back and you give the baby back to him and you're happy because, you know, you, you served, but you'd say, Lord, you know what? That was a really hard day. That was a hard day in the nursery. I'm not sure that you called me. I think I misunderstood. Perhaps nursery wasn't the word you said. Because it's hard. This is a hardship. Expect difficulty. Well, nobody was throwing rocks at you. I have to confess to you. Yesterday, at this point in the message, I said, <laughs> I said, <laughs> you didn't, just a second. <laughs> at that moment, <laughs> I said, you didn't get stoned that day, did you? So I'm going to start here again. <laughs> and I said it twice before I caught it. <laughs> oh, my word. <laughs> you didn't get stolen that day, did you? Okay. <clears throat> Regroup. <laughs> I don't know if I can come back from that. I shouldn't have told you. Oh, that was so funny. <laughs> to, to get stoned that day. Okay. I got to regroup for just a second to figure out what I was saying. <laughs> None of you got stoned, did you? <laughs> Don't answer. Okay. So in our faith, our faith in our doing, in our saying yes to God, in our faith that is not quite as bolstered as those who are persecuted, do we give up too easy? Because we don't think when we say yes to God that there's going to be difficulty. Do we think just because we're saying yes to God and we're walking in his will that life is going to be easy, that serving God should be like <laughs> daisies and roses and butterflies. We shouldn't. We should expect difficulty because that's what I see in the Bible. That's what I've experienced. When you say yes to God, it's a stretching moment. You're doing so something out of your comfort zone or you're ministering to people and there's a sacrifice. So saying yes, choosing to say yes 
comes with difficulty. So I'm encouraging you, when you say yes to God, which I want to encourage you to do, expect difficulty. And then you won't be shocked. You won't be like, am I not following God? Did I hear him wrong? You can say, yep, I heard God say, me do that, say it to me to do this. I expect difficulty and continue. Okay, so that's my first point, to encourage you to say yes to the Lord when he asks you. The second point I want to bring out to you, a second consistent pattern that I see in people in the Bible when they say yes to the Lord is that God will be with you. Now that's a comforting one, isn't it? To know that God that created the universe is going to be with you when you say yes to him. He asks you to do something, small or big, and he is going to be there with you. So let's go to scriptures and see what that looks like. We're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. I love the stories about Elisha. He's a prophet in Israel, and uh, the whole 2 Kings is just a great uh, book in the Bible. And to, to just encourage you to go read it, because it's very interesting, very amazing, the God that we serve. And Elisha was a fabulous, ama amazing prophet for God in this time. So let's pick up our story with Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. Now, when I read scriptures, I get a little bit dramatic in my mind. I picture things. I'm a visual reader, and so it comes into my mind. So as, we read, as I read this story, I'm going to ask you to just be sitting in a theater with one of those seats that rumbles, you know, with the sound and maybe shakes a little. There's theaters like that, right? Where they actually, you get excited about it. So I'm going to in interject just a little bit of, I don't know, Denise's brain function in here as I'm reading this. Second Kings chapter 6, verse 8. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God, Elisha, sent word to the king of Israel. Beware of passing that place because the Armen Ar Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on that place and indica indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in those places. This enraged the king of Aram. Okay, deep, ominous music is starting. You're sitting in a theater. It's kind of low and real quiet. Deep, ominous music because the story, the plot is thickening. The enraged king of Aram, he summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel. None of us, my lord, the king, and said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The music gets a little louder, okay? Are you feeling it? Are you watching this on the screen? Because in my head, it's on a screen. The report came back. Elisha is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. Okay, you're watching the horses and chariots come in, and they're rumbling. You're hearing the horse, you know, it's rumbling. The theater's getting a little louder. The seat is vibrating a little bit. They went by night and surrounded the city. The next morning when the servant of God, the man who served Elisha, got up and went out early the next morning, when the servant and the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? Big, ominous sounds. Big. It's big. Okay? And it's shaking. And you're like, you're tensing up. You can feel you're breathing a little bit more. Breathe a little heavier. You can feel that because it's, the tension's rising. The man of God is surrounded by the enemy. Okay? Don't be afraid. And things kind of lighten a little. There's a slight, lighter happier sound coming through the theater. Those who are with us are more than those that are who are with them. And then Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. The happy music's getting louder. It's getting louder. It's exciting. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills slowly, just slow, slowly he's seeing things. He saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire surrounding the army that would come to destroy them. Chariots of fire, the sound, the song bursts in, and you see these chariots of fire surrounding. The God that we serve, the God that is with us, is that God. 
the God that surrounded the army of Aram with chariots of fire. That God is with us when we say yes. When we choose to say yes to God, when we say, yes, God, I will do what you ask me to do, he is with us. I think that's amazing. I think we should have goosebumps when we read scripture. I got goosebumps telling you the story. Instead of sitting in a theater watching a, a fictitious, fictitious movie, we read the scriptures. We should get excited. The God who made chariots and horses of fire to be with us when we are in battle, that's amazing. And that should bring us peace. That should give us courage when we choose, yes or no, to say yes. Because we know trouble's coming, but we know God is with us when we choose to say yes. The third thing that I see, the third string that goes through the lives of people in the scriptures who say yes to God is that God will use you. When you say yes, God will use you. Aren't you glad? When you say yes, God will use you. Let's, let's look in scripture. Acts 3. We're going to go back to Acts 3, verse 1. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. And through this miracle, Peter had the chance to talk to people. And their numbers, the number of people that believed in Jesus Christ, went to 5,000 that day. That's amazing. That's amazing. And then they got put in prison. Saying yes to God <laughs> means you're probably going to have some difficulty. But God will be with you and he will use you mightily. So let's bring it back to Chisago City. The mom with the baby. She drives by the church and she sees the grass is mowed and the yard looks sweet and they have flowers and it looks like they really care about their church. So she said, you know what? If the people there care about their church, it's probably a church worth going to. Maybe I'll swing in there some Sunday. So the next Sunday she comes. And Deanne greets her at the door and makes her feel so comfortable and welcome. Shows her where the nursery is. And Daylene's in there watching babies. And she takes the little boy who has clear snot coming down his nose because he's teething. I wasn't ready for comments. So she grabs the baby and takes care of the baby in the nursery. And the mom comes into the sanctuary, and the air is on. Thank goodness the air is on because somebody tithed. So she can actually sit through the whole service, comfortable and able to relax. And then Tasha leads them in worship, and she is amazed at how warm she feels. And she opens her heart to God as they're worshiping. She's like, this is amazing. I want to worship this God. And then Pastor Bill gets up and starts preaching. And because Don is up there putting the scriptures on the screen, this woman has never opened a Bible before. She's never read the words. But because Don is serving and projected the words on the screen, she's able to read the scriptures. And when Pastor Bill says, hey, would anybody like to know this Jesus? Would you like to have a relationship with Jesus? She says, yes. She says, yes, because every one of you said yes. You chose, when God asked you to do these things, you said yes. And because you said yes, 
in whatever he asked you to do, you have changed a life for eternity. You have snatched that woman from hell, and you have placed her in heaven with Jesus and you and me, all because you chose to say yes. I find that amazing. We may never know the things we affect with our yes, but know that God is going to use you, and he's going to use you mightily. Expect difficulty. Know that God will be with you through it, and God will use you mightily when you choose to say yes. Now, I'm standing up here, and I feel the need to address the other side of this when you choose to say no, because there's probably someone in here, including myself at times, that is saying, you know what? I've said no. I've said no too many times. When I say no, there are two things that rattle around in my head. I, I maybe don't really love God, because who would say no to a God that they love? And what are the chances he's going to give me another shot? I've burned my shot. You don't get second chances. People don't give you second chances. For those of you sitting there, that are maybe thinking that or feeling that, let's jump to the book of Jonah. Chapter 1. It's a pretty familiar story, but I still want to read it because there's some things in here that I want you to see. Jonah chapter 1. The Lord gave this message to Jonah. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against them because I have seen how wicked its people are. There's the opportunity God just gave Jonah. Jonah, go tell these people, yes or no. Verse 3, but Jonah got up and went to the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He said no. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate soldiers shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted, get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused this terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come down on us? They demanded, who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? Not a question I'd ask. Anyway, Jonah answered, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the seas and the land. The sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them that he was running away from God. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop this storm? Throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. Instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to the land. But the stormy sea was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. Then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God. O Lord, they pleaded, do not make us die for this man's sin. Don't hold us responsible for his death either. O Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked up Jonah and threw him into the raging sea. And the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and nights. Did you notice in verse 9, the first point, the thing that runs around in my head when I've said no, is I must not have a, a true love of the Lord in order to say no. I want you to look at verse 9. Jonah professes, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. Jonah didn't give up on his God. He didn't stop believing in God. He had a moment of weakness and he said no instead of saying yes. So now I want you to jump to chapter 3 in Jonah. Chapter 3, verse 1. Jonah was in the fish. Remember, he was thrown in there, and the fish came and swallowed him. I need to point out, when I was little, I thought the fish was Jonah's punishment, okay, for disobeying God. That wasn't his punishment, death. 
He was thrown into the sea and he was going to die. He's in the middle of the sea, probably with one of those long biblical looking robes that pulls you to the bottom and sandals that make you can't swim. So he was going down because the whole second chapter is him saying how he was going down for the last count. And God sent the fish to rescue Jonah. And Jonah sat in the fish for three days. Some of you maybe are sitting in a fish right now. You've said no to God and you're in a fish. So let's see what happens to Jonah. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time after he had the fish spit him out on land. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given to you. Verse 3. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord. <laughs> Jonah said yes. <laughs> he, learned, he learned his lesson. No doesn't work so well. So some of you might be sitting in a fish. And you need to pray to the Lord like Jonah did. God, I'm going down. I'm going down. But please, I want to serve you. I want to say yes. You have given me the choice. You have given me the freedom to say yes or no. And this time I want to say yes. God gave Jonah a second chance. God's going to give you a second chance. So if you're sitting here and you're on the side of, I've chosen no too many times, I want to encourage you. God does give second chances. That doesn't mean that you've denied your God. This amazing God, full of grace and mercy, will give you another opportunity to choose to say yes. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand?